the research that he was collecting and where that ended up? No, I don't know that. Uh, I don't know that anybody knows it, but uh, it's around somewhere, you can be sure. Um, there's a lot that's around somewhere. I've been hoping that some of the relatives would come out of the woods now that the book's been published, but so far there's nothing new yet. Um, but I don't, I don't doubt that there will be something new to come out. Um, one of the interesting things about this collection that the book is written from, the, the collection <clears throat> is all in the Marietta College Library. And I've never encountered anything even remotely like it. It's unbelievable. There are thousands of letters under the Rufus Putnam collection. He was the general that went out. And, and an equal number, if not more, in the Cutler collection. And their letters, their diaries, but also there's an oil portrait, oh, an oil portrait of every one of my five main characters. So, I could, we, so we know what they looked like. And that's very rare because these, it's all happening before the advent of photography. And uh, so you really can get inside them. <clears throat> when I was, uh, again, one of the luckiest breaks of my education was Thornton Wilder was a, a, a fellow of Davenport College at Yale when I was an undergraduate. And you could go into the dining room for lunch and there would be Mr. Wilder sitting there and you could go over and sit down beside him and talk to him. And of course, <clears throat> being spoiled brats, we didn't realize what a great honor that was to be able to do that. But he was wonderful and particularly wonderful about the art of writing and what how it evolves and so forth. And I was so taken by his play, Our Town, and I often wondered maybe someday I might find some, a, a collection of letters and diaries sufficient for me to do a book about Our Town, as it were, only from real, with real people where all of what they say is out of what they wrote and recorded. And this is exactly what's happened. So the I, I never, never make up anything. I don't like had history written in a way where the author will say it was the, as the Secretary of State crossed the lawn into the White House, he was busy thinking about what to tell the president concerning blah blah blah. You don't know what he was thinking about. <laughs> he he could be thinking what's I wonder what's for lunch and. <laughs> Um, so you can't, you can't do that. Unless they've written it down, then that's all right. And they may be wrong, but you can, you can concede that in what you say along with it. I don't think there's any better way to teach history than to give a kid a project and give a kid a project that nobody's worked on and tell them, and I've done this many times at universities, tell them, when you finish writing this paper, you will be the world's leading expert on the subject. You'll know more about it than anybody. And that can happen. It has often happened. And they love it. And they, well, I was walking across the street in Washington one day, and this young fellow with business suit on came up and said, Mr. McCullough, uh, my name's Charlie Jones or whatever. What, and I was in your I took your class at Yale, at uh, Cornell, when I was an undergraduate there. And I'd given them all a photograph, and that was their assignment. And all it said was what the picture was about and the source of the, of the print. I said, what, what photographs you got? He said, uh, Sergeant York. And um, he said, and I love it, and I made World War I, my hobby. And in other words, he's still at it. And I said, well, what did you know about World War I when you got that picture? He said, all I knew was that I knew there was a World War II, so there had to have been a World War I. <laughs> but I knew nothing about it. And then all of a sudden, I think that's my pants are ringing. <laughs> I, oh, well, you're not going to, you know, you'll believe it. This is my high technology. <laughs> See? <laughs> I, I gave a talk at Boston College not long ago, and um, in the question period, they said, because I, I work on a typewriter, manual typewriter, 
and they asked me, is there any aspect of the modern uh, electronic devices that you do use at all? I said, oh yes, I have a cell phone. And I took it out and showed him the whole place bur burst into laughter. <laughs> so after I was finished, a guy came down the aisle and he came up to the stage and he threw a cap, like a baseball cap, up onto the stage. He said, I think you should start wearing this. And the cap said, Antique Roadshow. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Adam's decision to um, defend the soldiers, the, um, um, the difficult decision that he went through, um, and what the lessons were in terms of um, what we can learn from that very difficult well, I think that there's an infinite number of powerful lessons to be learned from the life of John Adams. Um, and that's certainly one of them, because he knew that by doing that, he was probably risking his political future and that he would be in the trash bag uh, for the rest of his life. But he knew somebody had to do it or we weren't fulfilling the pledge that we had made as a people. So he did it. And the people who could have been after him for having done it were proud of him, including uh, Samuel Adams and others. And it really put him in the right light for the rest of his life. He was also the only one of the founding fathers who became a president who never owned a slave, as was his son never owned a slave, right up until almost the time of the Civil War. Um, and that was, I think, in good part because of Abigail. She was a strong force in his life and in, and in John Quincy's life. And of course, John Quincy, as a, I expect you know, died on the floor of the House of Representatives battling slavery. Um, and he never stopped John Quincy. And I think John Quincy may have been intellectually uh, in IQ and the rest, the, the brightest president we've ever had. He wasn't a particularly effective president, but oh boy, was he smart. Um, when John Adams got to Harvard, his mother was, was illiterate. I think there was probably only one book in the Adams house that you're going to be going to tomorrow, I guess. <clears throat> and that was the Bible. It was a hard, hard life there. They were poor, and they were just barely getting by. And, the, and off young John Adams went to Harvard, and he said, I discovered books, and I read forever. He was in his mid-80s when he was he embarked on a 16-volume French history in French, which he had taught himself to read. Imagine. Um, amazing people. And there they live, right 10, 12 minutes away. And you're, when you go to the Massachusetts Historical Society, that's two presidential libraries in one, both John Adams and John Quincy. Uh, this part of our country that we all live in is about as rich in history as any place of all. And one thing I did learn from writing the, my new book that I hadn't appreciated before. I had sort of thought that the Puritans were people who all wore black and didn't want anyone to ever have any fun. <laughs> and uh, that's not true. They wore clothes of all colors. They loved to sing, dance, have a few drinks. They were human. And they believed in education. And they insisted on education as it is essential to being a fully um, developed human being and of course being able to read the Bible and better, better understand the mysteries and importance of heaven and God and, and all, the, all that Christianity entails. Um, oh, could I get going? Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Another question. Uh, a lot of people you write about are generalists. Uh, what do you think about specialization in society today in terms of where, especially schools, where kids are focused on a particular topic and getting the leaders in industry or you know, education field, a lot of focus on specialization. What do, you, what do you think about that compared to people you've written about in the past? Well, I'm a little, a little worried about it, a little leery of it. Um, I believe strongly in the liberal arts education, and I think it's essential. Um, when I first, for example, got interested in Wilbur and Orville Wright, all I knew is that in high school we learned that they were a couple of bicycle mechanics out in Ohio somewhere, and they invented the airplane. Then I began reading some of their letters, and I saw the, the quality of the language, the quality of the expressions of, of thought and vocabulary and the rest. And I thought, wait a minute. And they'd never gone to college. And um, Wilbur and Morville were raised by their father, who was an itinerant minister who, who believed in reading up above your level. And though they lived in a house that had no running water, no indoor plumbing, no central heat, no telephone, it was a house full of books. And he, the father said, if you learn to use the English language, both on paper and on your feet, you, in other words, speak, you will be way ahead of others no matter what line of work you pick. So I think the specialization should come after they've had a full education in the best traditional sense. And I don't like to get too um, dark and forb forbidding, foreboding about it. The, the level of our knowledge of history today has never been lower. And there, over 80% of our colleges and universities no longer require history to graduate. And that's a mistake. I think courses, some courses should be required, in particularly American history. It's also, I think, very important that these young people learn at an early t stage that some things in life are required. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, you know, with all the news that's going on today, I just feel like we're almost at that turning point in our... Like, you mind. feel that way? <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. No, truly. It's a dark, dark cloud. It's hanging over us right now. It's not only irrational and, and vulgar and un-American and stupid, um, <laughs> but dangerous. But I, I think it, it, knowing history is very helpful in that it creates, in a sense, someone who's a short-range pessimist and a long-range optimist, because we've been through very dark, difficult times before, more so even than now. Different, but dark. And we've come through it. And we will again. And strength of character is what matters. I, um, I um, started off to talk about the history, the teachers who have influenced people of importance. Harry Truman used to say, the only new thing in the world is the history you don't know. And. Um, he never stopped reading history, never went to college, and uh, he owed it all to one teacher that he, ha he had in high school, and her name was um, um, Margaret Phelps, and she was tall, thin, sort of severe-looking old maid lady who taught in Independence High School small, totally unimportant town. 
and she was phenomenal. And she said something, and I typed it up so I could share it with you today. She said something about history that I think is as good, makes the point, as well as anything I've ever read by anybody. History cultivates every faculty of the mind, enlarges sympathies, enlarges sympathies. That's, in a sense, what I was talking about, what, yeah, the empathy that we learned. Liberalizes thought and feeling. It increases your capacity to put yourself in the other person's place and feel what they were going through. Furnishes and approves the highest standards of character, the strength of character. That's what really comes through. And it's true today more than ever. Strength of character, people with backbone, people who will stand up for what they believe in. Imagine Margaret Chase Smith, the only woman in the United States Senate and a freshman standing up in the United States Senate and attacking the unacceptable behavior of Joe McCarthy on her own. And it made a huge difference. Harry Truman wrote to her, he was no longer in office, and said it was one of the finest examples of strength of character in political life he'd ever heard about. Um, we have so many people, have had so many people along the way who provide guidelines, who provide lessons with by the example they set. Is there another question? We'll take one more. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, when I uh, saw Hamilton, I was sort of struck by their treatment of John Adams. It's almost sort of brushed him aside. Is John Adams, and uh, it, I don't know, it sort of bugged me. And I was curious as someone that really studied John Adams closely that or just kind of this idea of this kind of people or themes in history sort of becoming in vogue? You know? Well, I haven't seen Hamilton, um, and I understand that yeah. it is quite far from accurate, but that's all right. Yeah. It, no, truly, if it gets them into the tent, gets, <laughs> gets them having some, some any interest in history or those individuals, I'm all for it, <laughs> truly. Um, and so it's, it's a form of art. It's an important form of art. And look, look how it's taken the country. It's, it's about music. And uh, I was asked to give a speech at the opening of the Revolutionary War Museum in Philadelphia, which by the way, if you haven't been there and there's any way you can take your students there, do it. It is fabulous. And at this opening ceremony, they had the star of the show came down and for a week trained a group of students in the music department of high school system. And they performed with him and it was fabulous. So I think we can let our hair down when the music starts to play. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>